um, that came out in August this year, um, closely followed by a review on the same topic. Um, and that's, um, sorry, trying to minimize here the um, videos, okay. And um, um, this study was uh, jointly supervised by uh, Michael Boonke, David Altschula and Mark McCarthy. And the topic is the genetic architecture of type 2 diabetes. Uh, the review paper um, I'm also going to mention briefly um, here because I use a few plots and facts from, from that paper. So that's um, um, by Jason Flanick and Jose uh, Flores uh, a month later. Um, okay, so to introduce uh, type 2 diabetes, it's a highly prevalent disease um, depending on uh, the population and the um, cohort uh, that you look, its prevalence is about 2.6 to 12.3%. And the influence of genetic factors has uh, been estimated to be uh, quite high, so heritability estimates ranging from 30 to 70%. Um, a recent, G, well, a recent twin study um, that did a meta-analysis on different twins that estimated also on the higher end to about 70%. Uh, and um, there are also a lot of environmental factors uh, influencing type 2 diabetes. The strongest one, of course, being obesity. So um, obese people have uh, up to uh, seven times increased risk to develop type 2 diabetes. And um, up to date, they have been around 80 GWAS loci identified that associate uh, variants with a minor LV frequency uh, more than 5% uh, with type 2 diabetes. But the heritability um, um, uh, that was explained by these GWAS loci is less than 10%. So here's a, a nice uh, overview from the review paper about the history of type 2 diabetes uh, GWAS. And um, you can see that the majority of cohorts is, of course, European, uh, but um, increasing numbers of um, uh, de st uh, studies in, with other um, ethnic background have also helped to identify more loci here. And you can see that the number of loci is still increasing here. Um, and still new studies are coming out here in uh, 2016. Um, like I already said, the heritability um, that these ATG was low site can jointly explain is uh, less than 10%. So it's um, the question whether there are just more um, uh, loci with small effects that uh, would um, uh, contribute to this missing heritability or whether we rather find rare variants with large effects. And um, to answer the last uh, question about the rare variants, um, the uh, following the paper set out uh, um, to do whole genome or whole exome sequencing in two different um, consortia. So the first consortium was the Go um, T2D consortium that did whole genome sequencing in 2,600 uh, type 2 diabetes cases in controls with the same European ancestry. And uh, the T2D genes consortium did whole exome sequencing in 12,900 individuals with multi ethnic, I think five different population uh, backgrounds. Uh, the first uh, whole genome se sequence approach um, was carried out um, in, um, in these uh, Europeans and uh, joint uh, analysis of whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and also gene typing arrays led to 26.7 million variants that were then subsequently tested for association. And um, a few estimates uh, of power and ascertainment um, gave quite good results. So there was near complete ascertainment of uh, single nucleotide variants with more than five counts, which corresponds to a minor allele frequency of more than um, uh, 0.1%. Uh, 
and uh, the accuracy was determined then to be also quite high, 99.9% for heterozygous genotypes. And um, um, in the power analysis, uh, there was sufficient, so there was more than 80% power to detect that two diabetes risk variants with um, a minor allele frequency uh, of about um, zero point, uh, more than 0.5% and odds ratio more than um, 4.7. Um, or even uh, a bit lower when they later increase the sample size. So what did they find in this very nice data set? Um, to sum it up, not much. So in the first analysis with only these 2,600 individuals, all the loci that they found um, were known loci. There was one loci a locus that was not previously um, described, but this is some a locus that they could not replicate in the, for the study. And the only low frequency variant that they found um, was a, had a minor early frequency of 2.6%, and that was already described in some Icelandic population. Um, and when they tested different sets of variants, coding variants, non coding variants, they also didn't find anything. So um, probably a bit frustrating at first. So um, they uh, tried to um, increase the sample size by imputing um, genotypes in 44,000 additional individuals. And um, they found uh, one U variant, um, but it's also a common variant, so not a no low, no low frequency or rare variant that they, that they found that was you, and all the other loci that they found uh, were uh, known loci. Um, yes, so the next uh, um, consortium, uh, T2D uh, con uh, genes consortium that did uh, the exome sequencing um, in these five ancestry groups, they also did, of course, power analyses and found that they had uh, also quite good power, more than 80%, to find um, variants with minor D frequency, 0.5% odds ratio above uh, 2.3. Um, and there they found um, only one locus significant, which is the PAX4 locus. Um, so the PAX4 locus was already known, but the variant is novel. Um, and this was only found in East Asians. And in East Asians, it has a minor allele frequency of 10%. Odds ratio, by the way, 1.8. And uh, it was virtually absent from all other populations. So again, not much that they, uh, that they found in a, um, a genome-wide significant level. Uh, gene level analysis uh, yielded also no result. Um, and when they did a gene level analysis with known GWAS hits genes, they found um, one gene FES driven by the PRC1 uh, locus in South Asians. Um, to then further increase their sample size, they did um, exome arrays uh, again and um, uh, could then estimate that they would. Uh, capture about 80% of um, these um, European variants that they um, found in whole exome sequencing uh, with a minor relief frequency above 0.5%. Mm. And the total cohort then uh, resulted in more than 90,000 individuals. And the association analysis found then only common loci. 30 loci though, um, which is nice, and there was one novel locus also um, where um, MTMR3 was uh, identified as the most likely effector gene, um, but uh, nothing with low frequency or rare variants. So some, some things that you could do with this uh, data set was uh, to propose candidate genes for GWAS signals. Um, this is something that they, they did with conditional analyses at no GWAS loci, um, where they could confirm the coding signals for five loci and find new coding variants um, at seven loci. So coding variants at loci were previously, um, it was rather suggested that a non-coding signal would uh, play a, a causal role. 
Um, and as an example, they point out the SOAP2 locus where the variant that they suggest and they found was just not um, found in the previous GWAS analyses because there was incomplete genotyping and poor amputation there. Um, the next thing that they were asking is whether rare variants were enriched in Mendelian diabetes 2 disease genes. And they did a gene-based test in 81 known diabetes genes and did find a signal, which was admittedly quite uh, modest. So p-value was 0 0.02. Um, but they could show that there was an aggregate association with type 2 diabetes risk, even though no gene, again, came up uh, uh, here by itself. Um, so these, uh, these are then um, the, the odds ratios uh, here on one side and the log 10 p-values on the other side uh, reflected by dots, the odds ratios reflected by bars. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see um, some, some signal here, but it's um, um, more in aggregate signal. And, uh, but in other gene sets, uh, so the monogenic OMIM set, um, this p-value was increased um, to 10 uh, to the power of minus 5. <clears throat> um, of course, um, um, these, these, uh, the first thing that uh, comes into your mind is, might these um, signals maybe be caused by individuals that by, were included uh, in this cohort by accident um, that had um, monogenic diabetes. Um, and uh, to disprove that, um, the authors uh, did uh, um, um, different things. So uh, first of all, they found no concentration in monogenic diabetes, diabetes genes um, in these rare variants. And then they also excluded all known disease variants that were listed in the HGMD, and the signal was still there. And there was also no correlation with age of onset, where you would, um, what you would expect if uh, the age of onset of monogenic diabetes is, of course, uh, a lot lower than the normal type 2 diabetes onset. Uh, so that's, that's quite nice. Um, next um, question that they asked, was um, whether there was an evidence for synthetic association um, testing the Goldstein hypothesis that says that common GWAS signal may result from clustering of rare variants um, on common haplotypes. Um, um, but this is uh, this they couldn't uh, they couldn't um, confirm this hypothesis. The ten strongest um, type two diabetes GWAS levels I uh, um, could not explain, so they first tested this um, by, uh, by these conditional testings in these, these 10 strongest GWAS loci and none was explained by rare missense variants um, with a 2.5 megabases of the index uh, SNP. Mm. And the statistical procedure they said even favored um, the synthetic association hypothesis um, underlining that, that negative result. Um, it was also negative, same negative result with all rare variants and in index um, signal related variants. Um, to do some functional uh, analysis in this data set, um, um, the authors uh, created 99% uh, uh, credible sets for each GWAS locus um, from the uh, GO T2D uh, uh, genome uh, sequencing, uh, whole genome sequencing data, and um, annotated these uh, with genomic uh, maps, chromatin states, uh, transcription factor binding site, um, this type of information to prioritize causal variant within these credible sets. And um, they used uh, a method uh, named uh, FGWAS. And this functional annotation reduced uh, the credible uh, set size uh, by 35%, narrowing in potential causal variants. And the associated variants were enriched um, 
first of all, in transcription factor binding sites and uh, coding sequences, but also in um, enhancers uh, that were found in pathophysiologically um, very relevant tissues. So uh, pre-adipose uh, pre -adipose tissue or adipose tissue, which is of course the, the tissue where you um, experience uh, effects of insulin uh, resistance and um, in the, uh, type 2 diabetes in pancreatic islets um, as another target tissue where you find reduced insulin secretion in type 2 diabetes so very made very much uh, making biological uh, sense here these findings mm. and um, in the next uh, uh, analysis, uh, the authors asked, um, or the more type 2 diabetes architecture. Um, so they, they did these um, modelings um, by population genetic simulation, where they would assume different uh, proportions of rare variants or low frequency variants um, to explain uh, the heritability. And what they found um, uh, quite, I think, um, good, uh, quite well to see here that uh, the common polygenic model, where they would assume uh, that low frequency in rare variants would only explain 25% uh, of the heritability, compared to these other models where they would explain more, um, that uh, this model resembles best uh, their empirical data. So that would um, then um, uh, support a more common polygenic uh, model of type 2 diabetes. So in summary, for type 2 diabetes, nearly all common variant associations that were detectable by whole genome sequencing were known. So that's in a way a good, uh, a good sign for all the previous uh, studies and um, that shows that all these genotyping uh, uh, SNPs are, did, a, did a good job. Um, only one low frequency variant was found and that's a variant that was pre previously reported in Icelandic population. Um, so that's the only low frequency variant that, that was found on a genome wide significant level. And um, I think with their model and all this other data, um, they can quite comprehensively uh, show that low frequency variants contribute much less to type 2 diabetes heritability than common variants. So what is the outlook then from the study? Um, larger sample sizes uh, lead, of course, to um, more GWAS loci, and this is probably then also expected that if we increase the sample size even further, that we will likely find more GWAS loci. Um, nevertheless, there are rare variants, or there have been rare variants identified in, uh, in populations, um, and it will be probably um, uh, better in order to identify those rare variants to study um, populations uh, with a reduced um, um, genetic variability, uh, populations with bottlenecks, uh, under stream selective pressures, um, like the Finnish, the Sardinians, and so on. Um, and um, yes, so it's probably uh, wiser to concentrate efforts for relevant association on these types of populations. Um, next thing, of course, is to um, or it's very important to predict uh, causal variants um, uh, with functional um, tests and um, annotations. And um, the authors of that review paper suggest that um, a type 2 diabetes knowledge base um, would be very help helpful to um, uh, connect uh, researchers. And um, the big question here also for us is, in how far does the genetic architecture of type 2 diabetes uh, resemble other late onset diseases like epilepsy, for instance? Yes, are there any questions?